Good to go. Don't look at me. All right. We're good to go. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I'd like to be here. You know, I, I'm a huge jazz fan. <laughs> and so this is a particularly cool place for me to visit because of Charlie Parker's time here, what, in the 50s or something. So I've never been here, and I got the awesome tour this afternoon. And it's just, this is an amazing place, so I'm stoked. Um, I, I'm also stoked to be here. Uh, so, sorry, why is that too bright? That that's fine. Okay. Yeah, if it works for you. Um, something like... 80% of the world's population lives within 60 miles of the coast. And it's no wonder, right? We love the ocean. We love it for all kinds of reasons. It gives us food, energy, oxygen, medium for transportation, uh, recreation. I'll bet some of you surf. It's a, it's a place of incredible beauty, a place for inspiration. You can revive your soul, if you will. All kinds of great things come from the ocean, right? We love it. Everybody loves the ocean. In fact, we love and use the ocean more than ever. And why did I lose my... There we go. So, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, human activities in the ocean were pretty much confined to the coastline, right? So, around the edges of our continents. Um, and we didn't really think too much about this issue of sustainability. We fished and drilled in one place, and when the resources were gone, we moved to another place, because we could, right? But now, human activities in the ocean uh, pretty much span the entire globe, particularly the impacts that human activities in the ocean are, are having span the entire globe. And not only that, but the sheer number of activities that we're doing in the ocean is on the, on the rise, they're increasing. And this is leading to conflict over how we use ocean space. All right? So here's some great examples. The Galapagos. You probably all know about the Galapagos. It's a place of incredible biodiversity, you know, some crazy stuff down there like marine, marine iguanas. Something like 30,000 species of marine plants and animals in the, around the Galapagos. Amazing, beautiful place. But in response to increased tourism, and fishing pressure in the region. In 1998, the Galapagos Marine Reserve was established, and that restricted fishing activities. Right after that, a group of 30 scientists and some giant tortoises were taken hostage by fishermen who saw their livelihoods being threatened by that management plan. Major conflict. No kidding. Scientists taken hostage. <laughs> Paris of <laughs> Yeah. Um, Okay, another place, maybe not so dramatic, but same kinds of issues, Madagascar. Here's a place, uh, again, amazing biodiversity. Fishing is central uh, to, to uh, uh, folks who live there, um, but uh, they've got increased population, increased wealth, and an increased demand for animal protein, or fish. So there's basically increased fishing pressures there that are lead, leading to conflict over how you use that ocean space. How do you manage the fisheries and who do you allow to fish where? Conflict amongst conservationists, but also amongst fishermen themselves about what they do where. And um, uh, you know, the oceans around Europe, we've got a, an emerging new problem, brand new problem of, uh, of a different sort actually um, created by conservation interests, but we've got the emergence of renewable energy, energy technology, wind farms, right, going into the ocean. And where these wind farms go, other activities can't happen, right? You can't fish there or for certain kinds of things, or maybe you can't drive a submarine there. Or, um, in any case, there's conflict over how we use this ocean space in Europe um, over, you know, an, an emerging new problem. Let's look at what's happening off the coast here. Um, in the Santa Barbara Channel, it's an amazingly active place. We've got marine reserves, major shipping lanes, you know, transportation zones, ports, offshore oil and gas facilities, commercial and recreational fisheries. All kinds of stuff is going on in the Santa Barbara Channel. And not only that, these activities overlap in space. Right? So I 
spent a lot of time sort of spacing out, <laughs> looking out out my my office window on, 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 on the Santa Barbara Channel, loving the view, but thinking about the fact that we really have to do a much better job of dealing with all these potentially conflicting uses and finding a way to balance the use of our ocean resources. This is my, this is what keeps me awake at night. We can't any longer <clears throat> view the ocean as sort of an endless frontier of resources to be exploited, which is basically what we've been doing, you know, up until recent history, like the last 10 years. We can't do that anymore. We have to now think about how we can protect and preserve ocean resources. But for what, right? Depending on your perspective, you may feel like we need to protect it for, you know, the ecosystems themselves because, you know, fish are pretty and I love to swim with the dolphins. Or you may feel like we need to preserve these, these resources because you like to eat fish, right? So we've got to preserve the oceans for the fisheries. Or maybe you feel like we need to preserve the ocean so that we can extract renewable energy, right? Maybe wind or wave or, or, or tidal energy or something like that and, and reduce and slow the rate of global warming. All reasonable per per perspectives. And in fact, this is, this is just the way the world works. This is a fact of life. We're always going to have differences in opinion about how we use ocean resources, right? So traditionally, this is how that, that, those differences in opinion and that conflict is managed. Government agencies work with scientists to come up with a plan. And that plan tells us what we can do in the ocean and where. It's a spatial plan. Then they reveal that plan to the public and they get their feedback. <laughs> and there's a problem with this, a traditional approach, and that is that it generally leads to more conflict, sometimes decades-long conflict. Um, think about, for a second, all the various people affected by these kinds of decisions, these stakeholders, so-called stakeholders. In addition to scientists and resource managers, you've got surfers, energy companies, um, conservationists, tourism industries, you know, commercial and recreational fishers, lots and lots of people are affected by these kinds of decisions. And when these people, when these stakeholders are not included sufficiently in the decision-making process about how we use ocean resources, they get upset. Fishermen don't like being told where they can or can't fish. Coastal residents don't like having a giant wind turbine, you know, constructed in front of their picturesque ocean view. So when stakeholders aren't sufficiently engaged in decision making, the plans they're presented with are met with resistance. Without their buy-in in, the, in these decisions, they fail often. And this happened recently in California. So in 1999, this law was passed, the Marine, Marine Life Protection Act. Has anybody heard of it? All right, a couple. Basically, the law said the state needs to create a network of marine protected areas. And these are areas essentially where restricting activities are, are, are fishing activities are restricted. So the state went about it sort of the traditional way. They, they, they contracted a group of very smart scientists. I mean, really smart. I don't mean that uh, uh, sarcastically. The best we know. Uh, from California and Oregon and Washington, really smart scientists. These folks came up with plans about where marine protected areas should go. And then they revealed those plans to the public. What happened? People freaked out. They freaked out. Fishermen felt like they were losing their most valued fishing grounds. Conservationists felt like too few of the important habitats were being protected. Really, very few people were happy. And the scientists were bummed because they put in a lot of work. They actually went through that twice. They tried it twice. Same basic reaction. Total rejection. Plans failed. The, the law was there. It was saying you have to have a network of marine protected areas. But they couldn't basically you know, follow through with the law because the public kept rejecting these, these excellent plans developed by the scientists. There's, there's several reasons why uh, the general public is not included 
usually, and this kind of decision making. One of those reasons is because in order to make these kinds of decisions, we've got to use cutting edge science and technology. For example, we use spatial information, right, geospatial models to understand where things are in the ocean. We use GIS layers, for example, that are derived from multi-beam sonar data, right, that describe the distribution of habitats, proxies for where all the cool critters are and things that you want to protect. Um, and we use spatial models to look at, say, the distribution of fishing grounds. For example, there's a group, Ecotrust, uh, that works out of Portland. They went and interviewed all these fishermen in person and online. They asked them to draw where they fished and then weight those polygons that they drew for their fishing grounds uh, with, um, uh, to, to represent where they're basically their their favored fishing grounds are. That was combined with logbook data, which tells you what the value of the fish were that they caught there. And that gave you a, what's called a fishing hotspot map. It tells you where all the good fishing is in terms of dollar figures. Fish here, very valuable fishing. Fish over here, not so much. Anyway, spatial models. These are GIS layers, so I think a lot of you know, are familiar with GIS. You know what I'm talking about. Then we use GIS to analyze these, these spatial models in terms of the management plans that we create, right? So we create a management plan. We want to create predictions about the consequences of, of those management plans. So we use these spatial data inside GIS um, to, to analyze and make predictions. This is the kind of information and technology that people spend at least several years, sometimes entire careers, mastering. Right? Um, people spend a good amount of time just kind of digesting, first of all, what GIS is, and then take, they take classes in GIS. So asking your average Joe, you know, Joe Public, to use this kind of technology on their own to make, to contribute to the decisions about what we do where in the ocean is a pretty tall order. So, this is me. 12 years ago, and at this point, Sean said, I uh, knew a lot about spider sex. <laughs> I knew nothing about GIS. Um, but I started this postdoc, and uh, I was asked to learn GIS to help PSCO organize their spatial information and, and start doing some modeling and, and um, so on. So I set about learning GIS. I'm the kind of guy who likes computers. Right? I like to take them apart, I like to learn software, so I'll, I get some technophile. For me, GIS was a bitch. I mean, it was just, it just, it was tough. It was really difficult. I, I, I ended up enjoying it, but I spent two years kind of learning to enjoy it. Kind of felt like a <laughs> GIS ninja at the end, but, but it, took, it took time to get there. So, I have real sympathy for people who, who need to use GIS to make these sophisticated decisions. And I'm telling you, asking people to, you know, to show up and learn GIS and contribute to spatial decision making um, is a tall order, given the kinds of technology that we basically have at our disposal on a day-to-day on -day basis. Um, so here's, here's my, my favorite example, because it's, it's, it's an application that's both a bitch to use and it's a really useful application. It's called MarkSan. It's probably the most, use, most used application, GIS application, um, for marine spatial planning, for making decisions about, for example, where marine protected areas should go. It's been used to design marine protected areas in Australia, in New Zealand, in the United States, in uh, the uh, United Kingdom, really all over, Coral Triangle, you name it, it's probably been used there. Um, it's the kind of application that, you know, you really have to be dedicated to learning. Even if you like GIS, this thing is kind of difficult to use. And I say that with all respect to Hugh Possingham, if he's <laughs> listening. Um, it's, a, it's, it's not a simple interface to use. Awesome application. Basically, what you do is you define your conservation objectives using habitat data. Uh, and then you define the costs that you're willing to live with by, say, protecting 
certain habitats using, for example, fisheries data. And then using MarkSan, you run what's called a simulated annealing algorithm, and you generate a, so a potential solution or set of solutions that tell you where you uh, might put, for example, a marine protected area um, at, while minimizing cost to fisheries. That's the idea behind MarkSan. If it sounds like a black box, and I'm sure if he was here, the guy who wrote this application, if he was here, he could explain it much better than I just did. And he would make it sound a little more digestible. But no matter what, I guarantee you, each of you, no matter how smart you are, would find it a bit of a challenge to use. And, and for those people who aren't just dedicated to using it, you, you, you'll throw up your hands. It's just, it's tricky. Useful creates great models that can guide your decision making, but not the kind of thing that stakeholders like to see. Now, this was used in California's uh, planning process early on uh, in, for, for planning marine protected areas around the Channel Islands. Fishermen were kind of bitter about that. Mm -hmm. They didn't feel like they, the, the resulting plans were very fair. They felt like the, 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 the planning process was kind of gamed by conservationists and scientists. They were suspicious of this application. And with, you know, when you're throwing around things like simulated annealing and optimization models, um, th this just kind of seems to be like a, a black box to a lot of people. I'm not saying that fishermen or anybody are simple-minded by any stretch. I find these things difficult to understand, and I like GIS and the idea behind optimization and <laughs> simulated annealing. Um, this was the tool that they tried to use in that example that I told you about where, people, where the scientists created plans and they, they revealed in public and people freaked out. One of the tools. So, the consequence of, in California of trying to use MarkSan uh, and other kinds of applications that were basically inaccessible to the average stakeholder was this, no MPAs. People just said, I'm, I, don't, I don't buy it, I don't like it, we're not going to have it, period. Plans fail. So, in response to that, this new thing was formed. It was called the Marine Life Protection Act Initiative. It was a public-private partnership, meaning basically uh, the Resources Legacy Fund Foundation, which had behind it money from the Packard Foundation, the Moore Foundation, and others. Uh, they, they bankrolled this thing, and they said, this is the way it's going to work. We're going to put together a planning process that puts stakeholders in the driver's seat. Stakeholders are going to draw the lines on the maps, and only stakeholders, scientists can't do it, staff can't do it, only stakeholders can draw lines on a map. They're going to be the ones that, that make the decisions about where marine protected areas go, period. So, this is how this process worked. There were groups of stakeholders, about 40 to 60 people. These were people that were fishermen and divers and artists and teachers and politicians and people basically represented a, a, a group of, of Californians that had some stake in the ocean. There was a science advisory team, uh, about 20 to 25 people. These were ecologists and economists and uh, oceanographers, um, resource managers who created a set of guidelines. And they said, okay, if you're going to create a network of marine protected areas that's scientifically defensible and meaningful in an ecological protection kind of way, these are the, these are the guidelines. I'll show you what those guidelines look like in a second. But that, so the, the initiative included a science advisory team. Created the guidelines, didn't draw the maps. There was this thing called the Blue Ribbon Task Force. I love names like that. It sounds ridiculous to me, but that's what it was called, the Blue Ribbon Task Force. These were people appointed by the governor. So this was happening back when, when Arnie was in, in power. Um, highly effective decision makers. These are people that are used to be, you know, being a part of public planning processes in front of hundreds, if not thousands, of screaming angry people. So very, very uh, uh, level-headed, smart, good people um, who oversaw the process, basically kept people in line and let them know, you know, look, you're not, you're, you're deviating from the act or, you know, this is, this is 
We're going to design the process a little bit differently to try to keep things going smoothly. Great people. And then ultimately, the California Fish and Game Commission. These were fo these are the folks that, that took the proposals that were designed by stakeholders and ultimately decided whether or not they would sign them into law. And here's the spoiler. They did. They took proposals from stakeholders and signed them into law. So I'll talk more about that in a sec. But this is, this is how we proceeded. We actually started, we divided up the, the, the coast into five regions, started in the central coast, moved to the north central coast, then to the south coast, and then the north coast. Started in 2004, we ended just last year. In each of these places, there was a separate group of stakeholders kind of representing their interests in that region, tasked with creating MPA proposals for their region, right? So it was a group of stakeholders in Central California that created Central California MPA proposals, and so on. And they had to come up with proposals that included marine protected areas that basically fell into these categories, okay? They could be marine reserves, which are no-take zones, can't do really much of anything in terms of extraction, right? no, no fishing in a reserve. State marine parks, which prohibit commercial take of fish, but allow some kind of recreational take. That's actually kind of an uncommon designation. Or marine conservation areas, which allow some kind of commercial and or recreational take. And that was a fairly common one. Um, so for example, you, you, a conservation area might be a place where you, you can't fish for anything but salmon by hook and line if you're a recreational fisherman. That would be an example of a conservation area. Okay, and then here were the design criteria that the science advisory team came up with and al along with help from, from the Department of Fish and Game. Boundaries should fall on straight lines. Okay, why? Because lines of latitude and longitude are what fish and game wardens use to know whether or not somebody's over the line and potentially violating the law by fishing in one place or another. Okay. So it's kind of simple, but it was important. You know, with complex polygons, it would be hard for fish, fish and game wardens to know where people were uh, crossing the line, so to speak. You had to have adequate representation of habitats. All right, so there were certain habitats we were really trying to protect. Um, and you had to capture those habitats in your marine protected areas at a sufficient level to really do a good job of protecting them from basically fishing behaviors. You had to replicate your habitats throughout your network of marine protected areas. So remember, we're not just talking about a, a marine protected area or MPA. We're talking about a whole collection of them up and down the coast, right? And so your collection of MPAs had to replicate habitats up and down the coast at those threshold levels. And your replicates had to be within a maximum threshold distance, okay? So they couldn't be too far away. There's all kinds of reasons for this which we can discuss, but I'm just trying to overwhelm you with all the rules here. <laughs> you had to minimize wherever possible economic impacts to fisheries, okay? So we really wanted to maximi maximize the level of protection. So what would be maximum level of protection in an, in an MPA network? Everything's a reserve, right? You can't always do that, right? Because if you do that, you're going to put a lot of fishermen out of business, maybe even entire communities out of business. So the game was to create a network of marine protected areas with maximum level of protection wherever possible, but while minimizing impacts net to, to, to fisheries. You didn't want to put people out of business. You didn't want to, you know, create entire towns that went belly up, which couldn't happen. If that sounds like a, a lot, I hope it does, uh, because because this is this is you know this is what average people in California were asked to do: create marine protected area designs that met all these criteria. Not only that, but they had to make these decisions in in two places: in stakeholder meetings and at home. Now, if you've never been to a stakeholder meeting, I highly recommend it. They're hilarious. I mean, and by hilarious, I mean really very scary. They scared the shit out of me. 
This is where people with really disparate ideas about what, what should happen come together and get very frustrated with each other. You know, um, conservationists who have really strong ideas about, I want to protect this habitat, go head to head with, you know, Joe Blow Fisherman, who says, if you put a marine protected area there, I literally will, you know, have to sell my house and my children won't go to school and that sort of thing. Very tense. These were places that I never wanted to go. So as, as a postdoc, I would have to go into these rooms and help these people try and talk to each other and make decisions using geospatial data. And frankly, it was a very frightening experience for me. They also had to make these decisions at home. Right? So at home, they had to prepare for meetings, consult with their constituents, come up with good plans, and come to these stakeholder meetings where they could, in a very level-headed way, present these proposals to their opponents and begin negotiating. Obviously, these are both situations in which using desktop GIS is very difficult. Um, you can't ask, well, as I've already said, you can't ask stakeholders to go home with a copy of ArcGIS and learn it on their own and start you know, do, doing some uh, spatial analysis. And frankly, in stakeholder meetings, the, the only option is to have, say, a GIS technician sit there at the front drawing lines and trying to capture people's ideas about where MPA should go, and then doing analyses, which are generally too slow to be meaningful. Um, and what happens is you get a lot of frustration over the fact that, you know, people have these ideas. Fishermen have these ideas. Conservationists have these ideas about where MPA should go or where they shouldn't go. They want to be able to draw that stuff on a map and get some immediate feedback on the consequences of those designs. But they can't because they don't know how to use the tools. Or they're forced to rely on a GIS technician who they may not trust. And, you know, like they may see the GIS technician as a part of the system that's, that's trying to screw them out of their fishing grounds. Um, or, you know, maybe they're, they're, they have all the faith in the world, but, but later when the design wasn't quite right, they sue the Department of Fish and Game because they claim that in the meeting their ideas weren't sufficiently captured. Right? And this, this happened as well. So, desktop GIS for stakeholders to use in either of these, not a good option. And this is what I spent, yes? Can I ask for horse trading here? Oh, horse trading. <laughs> uh, horse trading horses. horses. Trading horses. Oh, it's, it, you know, I, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. I'll, I'll give this up if, if you, you know. Okay. So, yeah. Is that a good way to describe horse trading? Seahorse trading. Seahorse trading. Okay, so I was thinking about this. It was actually a couple years into the MLPA initiative, you know, this process that I described where we decided stakeholders were going to be in the driver's seat doing the drawing of the MPAs. Um, we tried actually a couple times to create technology that would allow them to do that. Failed miserably. I mean, it really was horrible. It was just getting worse. So my, my buddy Matt and I, Matt Merrifield, who's the, uh, the manager of the California Nature Conservancy's GIS, uh, he and I were sitting in this, this cabin in, in Northern California. It's a place called Spindrift, actually owned by the Nature Conservancy. It looks out over, over the uh, Pacific Ocean, over, um, what is it there? It's uh, Muir, Muir Beach. Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. It sits right, right out over a cliff here. Actually, if you're standing on this platform and you take a big jump, you'll go 300 feet into the ocean. It's awesome. So we're sitting there in 2006, and we're having some beers. And we decided something's really got to change. <clears throat> Average citizens should have the ability to <clears throat> author their own proposals, draw their own MPA proposals, and have ultimate ownership out over how this ocean space is managed. It's just, it's necessary. <clears throat> so, so <laughs> we, it's necessary, but it's going to be really expensive. So we, 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 we went after some money, we got a million dollars, and we decided we we're going to build this thing called Marine Map. And a year later, we launched this application. It's a web-based application for stakeholders in, in California, not only those that are part of the initiative, but members of the general public as a whole, to, 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 to use to draw author MPA uh, proposals. So that's what I'm going to show you now. This is, this is just a little uh, animation, so I'm going to stop it. If you want me to go live with this thing, we can. But this is basically what it looks like. Um, you know, if you've used Google Earth or any kind of web-based mapping application, a lot of these features won't be, you know, too amazing to you. There's a list of data layers that describe where things are in and around the ocean. 
um, all kinds of useful stuff and stuff for reference, some biological data, some oceanographic data. Um, you know, a lot of it's just kind of, you know, points and so on. But it's using the Google Earth API, so it's kind of ga engaging and it's familiar to a lot of people. Um, you can do things like search for locations and measure distances and measure areas and so on. And again, this is kind of standard web-based stuff. It's 3D, super engaging. 3D is kind of fun. Not actually <laughs> necessary for this, but kind of fun. That's important. Um, and then here's where it gets kind of interesting. For the average user now, without, who, who hasn't created an account, they can start looking at these proposals that stakeholders are, are, are designing, these designs for marine protected areas. They can look at where they are and they, they can start inspecting them in terms of uh, learning about how well they're meeting science guidelines. So I'm going to show you what the, the design process looks like. Now, if you, create, if you create an account, which is easy, anybody in the world can do, you can just sign up and create an account. You can, you can go in there and start doing this. You can look at shapes that you've drawn and you can look at shapes that other people have drawn and, and shared with you. And by shapes, I mean prospective MPA designs. Right? They're polygons that represent where you think MPA should go. So this is it. This is, the, this is the, the, what stakeholders had to do. They had to draw MPAs. It's as simple as this. Click, 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 double click and it's clipped to the study region. How cool is that? Um, you can go back and you can modify your original polygon even after it's been clipped, so it makes it easy to edit it. But as soon as you do this, uh, then you're, 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 you're basically prompted to do one thing, one thing only. So you have to, to, to create proposals, you have to do this drawing, sketching, and then you have to name it. That's the only thing you have to do. Okay, so you have to create a name, that's my test MPA. Then you can, Give it a designation, so you can say, I want this to be a marine reserve, in which case it's a no-take zone, or I, I want it to be a marine conservation area, or whatever, and then here are the things I'm going to allow to happen in this marine protected area. So, for example, here I've just decided uh, this is going to be a conservation area, and I'm going to allow recreational hook and line fishing for surf perch. That's it. That's all I'm going to allow. And then I can go through and I can check off. This is really unimportant and unnecessary early in the phase. So you, can, you, know, you as well as stakeholders often could, um, just could kind of ignore this early up, so up front. But uh, basically you can go and check off the goals and objectives that this MPA is supposed to meet in terms of the, the act. Okay, so this particular MPA I'm saying uh, will, is, is meant to serve uh, to, to meet the objective of protecting and maintaining species diversity and abundance consistent with natural fluctuations including areas of high native species diversity and representative habitats. You, you, not necessary. Again, basically what this is is a means for stakeholders who are really committed to this idea to sell it to the science advisory team and ultimately sell it to the Fish and Game Commission. Right? So they're, they're trying to create proposals that the Fish and Game Commission will buy. Um, this is one of their ways of selling it. We've got this law. There are goals and objectives of the, of the act. This proposal is going to meet these goals and objectives, in my opinion. Okay? Just in my opinion. We can get back to that if you like. Okay, but here's what's cool. As soon as you hit submit, you get immediate feedback. This is really the, 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 the key point here. You sketch and hit submit and you get immediate feedback and this feedback tells you how well you're meeting science and policy guidelines. So for this particular MPA, um, I'm told immediately uh, that it, 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 it's big enough to meet science guidelines for size. Right? It falls within the preferred size range of, of 18 to 36, 36 square miles. Right? Um, okay, let's go into detail about these attributes and, and reports. So, again, as soon as you hit submit, you've got this report that tells you how big your MPA is relative to science guidelines. This one's big enough. So I'm going to have an easy time selling this to the science advisor team and ultimately the Fish and Game Commission. Um, what else is this report telling me? It's telling me that my MPA um, affords a moderate low level of protection to the habitats contained within it. Why? 
I allowed something to happen in that MTA. I said, I'm going to allow surf perch fishing by hook and line, right? Well, surf perch fish fishing by hook and line apparently does one of two things. I don't know, actually. You probably do. Um, but it either uh, creates uh, the problem of bycatch, meaning you catch stuff you're not really meaning to catch, um, or it damages the habitat in some way. So maybe the gear damages the habitat. Do you know what you did? Uh, I don't think for surf perch it does. Why did it get a, a moderate low level of protection? Uh, I don't know either. Anyway, this, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this kind of thing happened all the time. What would happen in this case? The stakeholder would present this to the science advisory team, and the science advisory team would say, I'll tell you why that rule is in there in the remap. It's because of, not the gear type, but maybe bycatch. Um, remap probably should have made that explicit. It didn't. Failure. Failure. Oh, oh, no. Oh. Um, yeah, I really do need to go back through this. Um, oh, 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 this is horrific. I can't scroll through this. What's the best way to do it? It's all because of surf perch. It's all because of surf perch. Okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of this really quick and do this another way. Um, here we go. This will be better. Skip, skip, skip. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So then, after finding out that basic information, you can look at how this MPA, this proposed MPA, could potentially impact fisheries, commercial and recreational fisheries of all kinds, from all these different ports. So this, this particular report isn't terribly useful. The more useful uh, version of this comes in just a second. But this shows you, for example, that if you put an MPA here, you're going to impact the Dungeness crab fishery out of Crescent City, the commercial fishermen, by 0.2%. Okay, that's, that's, you're taking away 0.2% of their fishing grounds. Okay, probably guys out of Crescent City wouldn't care so much about that. Or maybe they would. Depends on how much 2% or 0.2% is worth in terms of dollars, right? So that comes next. And in any case, this tells you something about how your, this individual MPA is impacting the fisheries. You also get a report on what kinds of habitats you're capturing in your MPA, um, you know, what levels. Um, this isn't terribly useful either, although some people use it. Here's where it really got interesting. This report tells you whether or not you're capturing those key habitats at a sufficient level to cross the threshold and meet the replication guidelines. So remember I said that stakeholders had to replicate their habitat, uh, their, their habitats protected in their MPAs throughout their network. Well, this report is telling me that I have captured all of these habitats that are in blue, so beaches, rocky shores, kelp, hard 0 to 30 uh, habitats, so on. All of those have been captured at a sufficient level to meet the replication guidelines. They cross the threshold. I haven't done that with hard 100 to 200 meter habitat. So if I wanted this MPA to serve as a replicate for that particular habitat, hard uh, 100 to 200, I'd have to capture an additional 0.13 uh, square miles. I don't necessarily have to. I don't, not each MPA has to be a replicate for each habitat. So this might not be a problem. But at least I know that if I want this to serve as a replicate, I know how to get there. At least I have some of the information that will help me get there. OK, moving on. Now, let's see, come on. All right, once you've created a bunch of individual MPAs, then you want to start group, grouping them together, right? Because the objective is to create a proposal for a network of marine protected areas. So all you do is create basically a bucket. And you take your individual MPAs, and you put them in that bucket. And you call it an array, which is just a prospective MPA network. And then you can start sharing these ideas with other people. Here's where the collaboration comes in. And this, is a, this ends up being a very powerful 
part of this whole tool because it's web-based and because uh, there are users that can be associated with groups, you can share your designs with other users as long as they're part of certain groups. Okay, and then if you share your shapes with those users over the web, they can copy those shapes, modify them, and add them to their own designs. Right, so that is, in a nutshell, the, 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 the collaborative feature in Marine Map that allowed people to share their ideas with each other and ultimately work towards some kind of compromise. Not the end-all, be-all solution, but a huge step in the right direction because we wanted people to come up with one, two, or maybe three proposals to submit to the Fish and Game Commission, not a bazillion. We wanted, to, we wanted to limit the number of proposals that went through. Okay, so finally, once you've created your, your networks, maybe you've shared those networks with other people, you can do analyses on them just like, like you would on an individual MPA. Um, so here's a report that's telling me how many, uh, how many of my MPAs in my, my network are reserves, how many are conservation areas, how many are parks, and so on. This is just the replication report for the entire for the entire uh, MPA network. Here's the one that I think a lot of people focused on uh, in the end. This is telling me how much, basically, money I'm going to take away from fishermen next year if this MPA network is put in place. So, for example, this particular network design that we're looking at here is going to cost the Crescent City commercial fishermen $129,000 next year, which represents 3% of their potential net economic, uh, of, uh, so 3% net economic impact for next year. That was a that was a, a, a kind of a report and a kind of inf information that I've, that stakeholders spent a lot of time discussing. Without this tool, without the ability to do this kind of thing in meetings, or at home for that matter, stakeholders spent hours, days weeks yelling at each other over stuff that in fact wasn't even verifiable or, or you know, you, you couldn't back it up with real information. Because they could use this stuff in meetings in real time, stuff that they used to argue about for days or weeks, they would argue about for about five minutes until they could do the analysis and say, oh, yeah, okay, we're really only talking about the difference between 100,000 and 125,000. It's not, it's not the end all be all to me. I can live with that. Really, really important. Uh, t uh, uh, report and, and, and the fact that they could do it in real time was key. Here's another one. So remember those spacing guidelines I told you about, how replicates had to be spaced a particular distance apart and that it's true for certain replicates, not for MPAs, necessarily all MPAs, but for, for replicates of certain habitats. Those spacing guidelines were kind of hard to digest for a lot of people. This report t tells, not only tells you whether or not your MPAs or, or your network is meeting space and guidelines, but it also is a really great, great way of learning about those guidelines themselves and figuring out exactly what they mean. So here we're looking at um, the, the spacing report for this particular MPA network, and it's showing me that for these habitats now, that for rocky shore replicates, um, I am meeting science guidelines for spacing where the lines are green, okay, so the green lines are connecting replicates, which are highlighted in yellow. And where, the, where it's green, I'm meeting science guidelines. Where it's red, I'm not. Okay, so up in the north here, I've got a gap between my replicates for rocky shores. That's telling me this, this, this isn't going to fly in the eyes of the science advisor team. So I've got to do something in order to improve that design. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to turn on the, the shore types data layer, find out where the rocky shores are, draw an MPA somewhere in between those two that are too far apart, and get closer to meeting the science guidelines for, for spacing. Okay, so maybe that seems like a lot to you, um, but I think what people found was they, they would play with the application, even if they didn't fully understand the design guidelines, they would play with the application, find out where they were basically getting a thumbs up, and find out where they're getting a thumbs down, and they would learn about those guidelines, start to gain some curiosity about those guidelines, ask science advisory team members, why is it that I didn't meet 
uh, science guidelines here, what, what's up with the level of protection, um, and they learn about the science and, and, and the reasoning behind creating these, these uh, proposals in this particular way. Okay, so that's marine map. And I can go into more detail about that if you like um, at any point. Um, we, can, we can do a live, uh, live view of it. Um, so, marine map, in my opinion, was hugely successful for a lot of different reasons. Uh, in sort of post hoc evaluation, stakeholders raved about it. They said, this was one of the most, actually a lot of them said this was the most important tool made available to us in the design of MPAs um, because it, for all the reasons I just sort of mentioned. They drew, in Southern California alone, they drew over 30,000 prospective MPA designs. Right, so members of the general public and, and stakeholders drew boatloads of shapes. And each one of those designs was automatically evaluated um, and, and measured against science and policy guidelines for ecosystem protection and minimizing economic impacts to fisheries. I think that's huge. Now, over time, those 30,000 designs were whittled down into a handful of proposals. How? That's an interesting question. I'd love to talk to you about that at length at some point. But basically, the answer is because we had awesome facilitator, facil facilitation and you know, talented facilitators who were telling them they had to reach consensus. There's nothing in Marine Map that was telling them how to, how, to, how to reach consensus. There were features in Marine Map that allowed them to collaborate, but if they weren't forced to collaborate, Marine map wouldn't have helped them whittle down those 30,000 shapes. That's an interesting thing, an interesting problem to consider when creating the next version of such a tool. But I was thinking about this problem last year, about what, what is so special about it? Why did, why did Marine map work? Because it really did work really well. Um, and this guy, Jack Dangerman, walks into my office. He's, this is the guy, he's the CEO of Esri, this company that makes ArcGIS kind of big software company. And he takes a look at Remap and he says, well, that, the reason why that works is, is that's what geodesign is. And, um, and I said, that's an awesome word. I've never heard that before. And I feel like an idiot now because it's a word that's been used for about 30 years to describe a very powerful process. I just hadn't heard it before. I don't read the literature. Uh, but he said, okay, well, here's what it is. Geo, in geodesign, all you do is sketch which is something that absolutely anybody can do, right? And the most, the best designs in the world, whatever they are, think about them. If they're, you know, buildings, if they're uh, subways or churches or I don't care what, they start with a sketch, right? They don't start with some sophisticated model or algorithm that tells you, you know, what to do. They basically start with sketches. And in geodesign, that's, that's the essence of it. You saw what happened in, in Marine Map. The sketch is just drawing that polygon. But in geodesign, when you sketch, you get automatic feedback on the potential consequences of your design. And by iterating through sketches and feedback, you kind of combine science with the unencumbered art of design. Right? You get to freely explore any potential design and learn as you go the consequences of your design in terms of the effects it has on the world and its people, right? in terms of the effects of ecosystem protection and minimizing economic impacts to fisheries. That's what geodesign is. And it's something that absolutely anybody should be able to do. So now I'm a convert. I get it. I appreciate how geodesign technology transformed or helped transform ocean planning in California. So my mission now is to bring this to the entire planet. I want everybody in the world to be using geodesign for marine spatial planning. That's what I'm going to do. And that's why my lab is building this application called SeaSketch. Okay, so Jack said, I really, really like you to, to develop the next version of marine map using um, Esri technology. We had been using open source technology, so he said, I'd like you to use Esri technology. And I will fund you at a level that you can actually have some real, you know, impact on marine conservation in 
two or three places in the world. And I, the, I said, well, how about New, New Zealand and the Galapagos and I don't know, um, Mediterranean. He said, okay. So we're going to do that. We're, we've, we've begun building this application called C-Sketch. So C-Sketch, you can think of as just the next generation collaborative geodesign application for ocean planning. Like Marine Map, it's a web application. That's one website. So, in C Sketch, because it is dead simple to use, I mean really dead simple to use, you know, probably fifth graders could use it, um, you can go in and start designing marine protected areas, alternative energy sites, transportation zones, aquaculture zones, and you can do it using the best available science and data. That's the idea. How? That's kind of an interesting question. Whoops. So, first of all, like Marine Map, you'll be able to go in and view spatial data layers that describe the distribution of important resources like habitats and um, uh, wind energy potential or the uh, um, fishing hot spots and so on. Those data are drawn from authoritative sources all over the world. Okay, so Marine or Sea Sketch isn't hosting those data. Those data are coming over the web by way of web services from various places in the world, like you know, government agencies or scientists or whoever's got the data. And then just like in Marine Map, you use those layers as a reference to sketch spatial plans. But let me be clear, when people are doing this, they're really just expressing ideas or opinions. You know, like, I think an MPA should go here. And it could be a totally arbitrary idea. This is what I think, or this is what I feel. This, we should do this here. Or they might be asking a question. Well, what happens if we put a wind farm here? And then they get automatic feedback that tells them uh, the consequences of those designs. That's geodesign, right? You can do that for any kind of marine spatial planning you can imagine. Then they can share these ideas in a chat form that's dynamically tied to a map. How many of you have heard of um, Google Wave? That's really interesting. <laughs> this was technology that was developed, I don't know, two or three years ago or something, and they, they kind of floated it out there. Google floated it. It didn't really work very well. But this, what we're doing is we're, we're modeling this technology after Google Wave, which was, I think, a good idea, but not implemented very well. We're going implement, to implement it very well. Basically, this is what happens. You, you can, you can, you've got a chat window side by side with a map. And as you're chatting, you can turn data layers on and off, and you can draw on the map. Um, and as you're changing the map state and as you're chatting with people, all those changes are saved so you can go back in time. You can use a time slider and see what people said when and what they, what they were looking at when they said it. So when somebody says, I want to protect this area, and they've got the kelp layer turned on, that's recorded in the chat form. You can invite people to chats just like you might invite people to you know, participate in an email chain. You, know, you add people, um, and you can grow your groups. That group could be moderated by a facilitator. It could be unmoderated. It could be totally public. That, I think, is transformative technology because all kinds of important things are said amongst people in their negotiations that needs to be captured to help us understand the reasoning behind their decisions or the poor reasoning behind their decisions. People like the Department of Fish and Game Commission, they're going to want to know why someone came up with a, with a proposal, not only because it met science advisory team guidelines, and oftentimes they didn't. They want to know, like, yeah, why they didn't meet guidelines, or you know, uh, why, you know, why they made the decision um, not to meet the science guidelines, even though they could have. That kind of information can be captured in this kind of chat form and used a, a, as a means of understanding people. Okay, there's lots, and there, I think there's lots of other, you know, things that this will help with. And we can go into that if you like, but I think that this is revolutionary. Personally. So I'm very excited about that. 
How are we doing on time? We're doing. Okay, I'm going to skip this. <laughs> you're good, you're good. Okay, I'm going to skip that and come back to it if it's of interest to people. This is this is the sort of the punchline. We are um, going to launch this application first for New Zealand. Um, I'm stoked about this. This is, a, this is a country that cares a lot about conservation. Um, they've got a lot of beautiful things there. The Haraki Gulf is right near uh, Auckland. Place of incredible biodiversity, beautiful. But man, a lot's going on in that place. They've got something like one boat for every three people in the region. Something like 300 recreational, 300,000 recreational boats in the Haraki Gulf. They've got, you know, fishing. It looks a lot like Santa Barbara Channel in terms of activities. It's just it's bonkers. So much stuff going on there. They need spatial management fast. But they get that. The Auckland Council, the New Zealand Department of Conservation, they contracted us to use C-Sketch and put stakeholders in the driver's seat. So this summer, starting in August, average folks in New Zealand are going to start deciding where aquaculture is allowed, where conservation zones are going to be, where transportation zones are going to be. Um, you know, these, these are just, just, just like Californians. You know, they've, they've got uh, lots of people who are not GIS savvy, but they're going to be using geospatial data and information and, and technology to make these really important decisions. It'll be fascinating for me because a large, large part of the population there is Maori. Um, so it's, it's going to mirror, mirror sort of some of the interesting things we had going on in North Coast of California with the Native American tribes up there, different ideas from folks like people in my family. Um, about how resources are shared or not. So, uh, cult great cultural experience. And then um, we're also going to the Cook Islands to do this. So, who's, who knows where the Cook Islands are? You, that's awesome. I didn't know until like three weeks ago when I met the Prime Minister. <laughs> um, I, I, I met the Prime Minister from, from the Cook Islands who declared that he's going to create the world's largest marine park, one million square kilometers. And so, I'm going to get to go and, and work with the Maori people in that culture um, uh, to help them establish this marine park. And we're going to use Sea Sketch to do it. So very, very cool. All right, so they, he, this is the last slide. The point I want to make is, you know, we're, we're basically at the point in history where this, the, the tools required for making sound decisions about how we manage ocean space are no longer restricted to those with specialized knowledge. Now, I hope that all of you get the specialized knowledge to kind of push geospatial information and technology in the direction that we're going here. But not everybody's going to be able to do it, and not everybody should. Everybody should be able to express their opinions about how ocean space is managed, and then measure those opinions against the best science, right? So that's the idea behind C-Sketch. When we launch this thing, we're going to invite everybody to the table. <clears throat> everybody in the world who has an internet connection and a web browser is going to be able to go and participate in decisions about, you know, everything, all the important decisions, I think, about how ocean space is managed. And as a, as a global community, we're going to create plans for sustainable fishing and energy extraction and conservation, all sorts of good stuff, security. And the way we're going to do it is through collaborative geodesign. That's, that's, that's vision. So thank you, and I'll take any questions. Yes. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I can I can see why like um, with being able to actually get their hands on it and, and manipulate areas and, and seeing like changes would uh, give people a little bit more of a sense that it wasn't a black box. But do you like? I I is there any more specific reason that? you know, a scientist taking a more um, obtuse program and coming out with a result, they feel that this is, um, that the results that they're getting back are, are good. Because, I mean, in the end, they're still just manipulating a program and, and someone else's, like, numbers are telling them, they said, like, oh, you lose, like, uh, this much, you know, it'd be this economic impact, or, no, this isn't really acceptable, like, are, are people more readily accepting those numbers, or is it still kind of occasionally they'll dispute, like, they'll make a change and we'll see something like, oh, this doesn't feel right to me in the end, like these numbers. I'm not sure I understand. I, I, mm -hmm. explain, ask it again. Okay, it's a good so point. With, uh, with a previous, like, the previous generation yeah. uh, GIS stuff, yeah. 
um, people, they, they would see this black box. Like yeah. they say, well, where, where are you getting these yeah. letters from, right? And now they seem to be a bit more accepting of, you know, the information that's coming back. Like, mm -hmm. okay, if, if we set up uh, this sort of thing here, mm -hmm. this is this is the economic impact, yep. uh, this is what's necessary for the science. Right. Why are they, like, accepting, Why are they those accepting numbers? That? Yeah, in, in, in that format. When, you know, it's not like they're exactly going out and researching and, right. and agreeing with that. Someone's right. still telling them, right. well, these are the numbers. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good point. Um, so, I think you probably have some opinions about this. And I'd be curious to know what your answer is. Um, I think you know, part of, the, part of the, the issue of selling people on the use of these data and, and these tools is by explaining clearly how, how these data were arrived at, you know, how they were collected, um, giving them a very clear sense of uh, essentially the uncertainty in the data. Um, and, and so I think the process did a fairly good job of just being transparent about what the data, the data, how the data in Marine Map, for example, were good and how they were not so good, and where, where they were uncertain. There could have been lots of better measures for, for, for this sort of revealing uncertainty in the data, and that's one of the things I want to accomplish in C-Sketch. But, but um, the process, I think, it wasn't so much the Marine Map, but it was the process around it and all the facilitation, all the discussion that I think led people to have a little more confidence in, in, um, in the data and the tools that they were using. And I think it's just easier to, to, the rules of thumb that the science advisory team came up with were just, you know, they were just so much more simple than, than, than trying to wrap your head around a simulated annealing algorithm and an optimization model. That's just, that's what I think. And regardless of just sort of the difficulty of understanding um, optimization algorithms and so on, Mark Sand had baggage. Like I said, it was used previously. People kind of felt screwed by it. And so it didn't matter how much you explained it or how much confidence the rest of the world um, involved in spatial planning had in it. They just weren't going to like it because it felt like it was another tool to screw them out of their fishing grounds. So uh, is that your, your perception or other, other reasons? Yeah, I agree. I, I think, I think um, an example of that would be another sort of different group would be the whole insanity that happened over the climate change discussion. So there were some people that didn't believe in climate change that pushed it, but, but the real nut was that it seemed like some people were, were keeping something from the group, right? And, and, and so I think the reason why that story has legs and has legs is because people felt that some folks thought they were too smart and they wanted to keep their discussions to the, you know, in private and that they were telling you what you thought you could handle. And that tends to send people up Especially if you don't know what their livelihoods, that tends to send people, you know, they're like, you can't tell me that. And once once you get to that point, it's very difficult. So I haven't been to a planning meeting in Santa Barbara since the problems happened. There isn't at least one fisherman that gets up and just sort of screams and yells. Yeah. And, and, and it's not because there's anything wrong that was said there, but it's because the guy's pissed off from what happened three years ago. And that, that baggage is very difficult. So once you, once you start that way, it's very difficult to come back. Yeah. Yeah, but I think you're, you're, you know, something you just said reminded me, um, a big part of what people really want to do is just express their opinions. You know, this is my plan. I don't, you know, I don't care even what the feedback is from Marine Map or what the, what the results are from a Mark Sand run. I just want to tell you what I think is a good plan. And so if you, cr and I want to be able to share that with people. I want to share it with the world. You know, people want their megaphone. Marine Map basically gave people that opportunity, captured their ideas. They were the authors. That's why they liked it. Yeah. How did uh, the fishermen feel when you showed an example? You showed a, like a three percent, uh, you know, dent from their income. How were they receptive to that compared to the amount that they were actually protecting? Like, were they for protecting, even though like they could clearly see that this would take an amount from their income? Yeah, this is this is this is a really interesting question. Um, you know, most fishermen were were of the mind that marine protected areas were unnecessary and a bad idea. But they were at the table because they, if they weren't, they were at risk of losing more than if they were, right? So they were kind of there reluctantly. Right. Um, 
it was unusual that there was a, a, a fisherman in a stakeholder group or in the crowd that, that said, I like marine protected areas because I get it, you know, we're going to create these sources of big happy fish that I can catch outside the, 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 you know, the boundaries of the marine protected area and this is going to be good for my, for my fishery five years, ten years, fifteen years down the road, I think. That was an unusual perspective. So most of the time when they saw a ding in their income, that was just another thing that they were going to use to to say, I don't like this design. So the three percent was less than, say, like a ten percent that the scientists wanted. Right. right. I mean, the presumption was, yeah, scientists are going to uh, are, are basically more are more conservation oriented, and, you know, which isn't true. And this is this is very interesting. This isn't true. The designs. Remember those good designs that scientists came up with in the Central Coast that I told you about before this whole marine map thing started. No, the initiative. Those designs impacted fisheries less than those that the fishermen themselves came up with, or the stakeholders as a group came up with. So they were kind of moaning about this process that scientists were, you know, uh, kind of moving ahead with. But in the end, when they were asked to decide, they, they didn't make well, necessarily uh, better decisions. They kind of impacted themselves more. Interesting. Same with the science, same with the conservation too, right? Same with conservation. Yeah. I guess you have to move to the middle. That's right. I mean, you know, at least at the end of the first the first couple of rounds when scientists were at the helm and, and revealing stuff to the public, in the end, there was no protection. But at the end of the process that, that you know, that the stakeholders were involved in, there was 16% of the ocean protected. Half of that was no-take zones. That's huge. That's up from 1% in 2004. Massive, massive increase in protection. Maybe not the best we could do, but definitely a lot better than what we had. Other questions? I'll just say the other carrot, I guess, in your next question was that every five years these have to be reviewed. So there was also the idea that if it was totally chundered, if it was super horrible, these things weren't necessarily going to have to stay this way for a hundred years. So that was another part of the trying to be collaborative kind of process. Uh, Tess had a question. As long as you're going local here, it's yeah. not big. Um, if we go even bigger and go beyond the oceans, ah, course, yes. Um, what do you think about the role for citizen science in general? And you've already suggested some of the issues here, but could you elaborate on what you would see as the potential downsides of? empowering citizens, the role of citizen science, yeah. and where it can go terribly wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, perhaps. I mean, I, you know, we're, we're handing ordinary people <laughs> very powerful <laughs> tools. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, where's, where's the role for the, the scientists yeah. versus the citizen scientists yeah. Thank in you. general? And yeah. not just marine, but... Right. Because, because we can do that. This is the right. coming trend, and geoscience is a piece of that. Right. Citizen science is another piece, and all these very cool things like transparency and yep. being involved. And in, 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 if you're involved in something, you are less likely to criticize it. But that doesn't mean that it's better. Right. So there's an yep. interesting little place there. For sure. For sure. I, yeah, this is a really, really good point. I sort of skipped over this um, at the end there, but you know, scientists uh, need to be creating better optimization algorithms. They need to be creating better modeling tools to inform these kinds of decisions. And there's no reason why C-Sketch uh, couldn't contain within it a Marxian module that you know, those who want to use it could use to create um, optimal models, you know, models that say this is, this is where you should, you should do it. It wouldn't force you to take that solution, but you could use that solution in your, in your design. Um, there are, and I'm sort of going off to the tangent here, but we, we intend to put in um, trade-off analytics that do sort of are somewhere in between a Marxian kind of approach and a marine map kind of approach where you're allowed to sketch your arbitrary designs, but then that's plotted on a trade-off curve that shows you where that lands in, in some sort of optimal space, guides you towards something more optimal. So scientists can, can do the, the modeling behind the trade-off analysis um, and that gen can populate that, that, that optimality curve or, or space um, to inform the, the designs and so on. In terms of, um, uh, well, you mentioned citizen science, and that made me think of crowdsourcing information and asking people to, to, to contribute information over the web. C-Sketch will have tools for people to create basically spatial surveys. So 
I want to know where the fishermen are fishing and what their value is. I can spin up a, a, a project and collect that kind of information. I want to know where there are strandings of, of whales or whale strikes or whatever. I can spin up a survey and invite the whole world to, to contribute information that way. Designing those surveys in a way that the, the data that you collect is actually you know, meaningful is a skill that I don't have. So I would be working with social scientists and so on to people who are used to collecting this kind of data on the web, make sure they were meaningful data. But um, I think that there's always going to be a role for the scientists to, um, to basically create the rules of thumb that the science advisory team created or you know, design the next best bioeconomic model um, to inform designs. But they may, I, I, think they, I, think, I think ultimately you're still going to want to create a space that allows people to you know, offer up any cockamamie idea they have and then measure that against what the best scientists are saying is the best solution. That's, you know what I mean? Like have a quantitative measure that says your baloney idea is not respected by you know, scientist A. And that can go to the fishing Fish and Game Commission, and the Fish and Game Commission can decide whether they're going to go with this baloney idea or those that are more along the lines of what scientists in the world believe are good plans. Is that, am I yeah. addressing that? Yeah. What yeah. kind of uh, programming background did you have? So, I mean, to go from just like having a few beers to all of a sudden, like, so <laughs> yeah. how, many, how many beers did you have to make? <laughs> Was it, was it you or your buddy? Or <laughs> you Neither of us. So I, my, the extent of my programming uh, background was in AML. If any of you used ARC macro language? Uh, this, is, this is, you know, a generally obtuse uh, um, language that nobody uses anymore really for, for in, in ARC. That was it. And I think maybe I learned Pascal like 40 years ago or something. Um, that was it. I really am not a programmer. Um, I like technology from kind of the end user perspective, but I'm not a programmer. So what I did was um, I hired the best, <laughs> best people into my lab. Um, and I got very, very lucky. Really, I got very lucky. I hired this guy named Chad Burt. Chad was fresh out of UCSB's um, Creative Studies program, just graduated. And I'm telling you, this guy is just amazing. Um, so I, I, I hired him and, and said, Chad, help me out with this, and he went berserk, and he's really the brains behind Rain Map. I'm just, you know, the guy found him the funding. Um, and, and then since then, we've, we've kind of developed the group, and, and we, with Marine Map, we partnered with this, with this group, EcoTrust, who had some developers, and they were very good. Um, and uh, we worked with, we, I hired some folks temporarily from, from Farallon Geographics, but all along, basically, I've been struggling to kind of understand uh, their jargon and understand the pieces and then make the right decisions about what we do in order to achieve what I imagine is the objective of the NLPA initiative or the objective of the Department of Fish and Game in terms of participatory design. That's, that's my role. I have some more questions, but we should probably let uh, pause it there for the formal questioning. Thanks, Will, again. Thank Will again. Very cool. We'll hang out for a few minutes. If you guys get going, but we'll hang out for a few minutes if you guys have some questions. But uh, thanks, everybody. Hope to see you all next week for Tom Gillespie. Thanks, you guys. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I don't, I've met him once. So. We're residents together. Yeah. That's right. He's insane. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So here's my question. So my question is, are you going to do the global stuff? Yeah. I have two questions. Can you do the global stuff? Yeah. Yes. Actually, let's, let's stop this so we can, we can save it so you can get I, out I'll of it. Be, I'll be getting a whole new experience. But my question is, where the heck is it?